Hello, my name is Tom Menz. I'm a professor at the University of Mons in Belgium, and I will talk to you about some empirical research we have been doing on the use of semantic versioning practices in different package distributions, in particular Cargo, NPM, Packagist, and RubyGems. This research is part of an ongoing research project called Seiko Assist, whose goal is to try to provide recommendations for software ecosystems for improving software development practices. You can find more information about this project on its uh, website, seikoassist.github.io, and we also have a Twitter feed. Most of the research I will be talking about today has been previously published in scientific conferences as well as uh, some scientific journals. So we have been doing empirical research on software package distributions over the last five years or so. For example, we have looked at security vulnerabilities on the notion of technical lag, on how fast these dependency networks are growing over time, about semantic versioning, about the effect of zero major versions, and most recently about backporting practices. Today, I will focus on two of these publications in this presentation. To start with, let me briefly recap what semantic versioning is. So the full semantic versioning specification can be found on semver.org and any package release that wants to be semantic versioning compliant is supposed to convey in the version number what is the purpose of the next release. If the next release is only a patch, so you're only introducing bug fixes, then we will just update the third uh, component of your version number. If, on the other hand, your release is also introducing some changes that are perhaps affecting some functionality, but that are still co supposed to be backward compatible, then you can upgrade your minor version number. If your release is suspected to be uh, backward incompatible, so it may introduce some breaking changes in your clients, then you should update the major version number. Package managers tend to use dependency constraints to indicate whether they want to follow these practices and whether they trust the dependents. Uh, for example, if you use the caret constraint, then you say that you allow any patch update or any minor update of the package you depend upon. This is the recommended practice when you want to follow semantic versioning. One can also use less strict constraints, for example the tilde constraint, which will only automatically uh, allow you to benefit from patch updates, or you could even use more permissive constraints, where you would also automatically allow any major update. So uh, what we uh, did in some early analysis, specifically for the NPM dependency network, was to find out to which extent the use of dependency constraints reflects and impacts the outdatedness of packages. So what we found was that uh, in NPM, one out of every three packages never actually updates their dependency constraints. And as a result, the packages become outdated because they do not rely on the latest version of their dependencies. Uh, why this is the case and how frequently this is the case depends on the exact dependency constraint that is actually being used. Uh, so we did a small analysis where we looked at the evolution over time of all dependencies being used. We focused only on runtime dependencies and what we found was that when you look at all possible uh, runtime dependencies, uh, over time we see that there is an increasing use of the caret uh, dependency constraint which becomes the most prominent. In fact, since its uh, introduction as default constraint in 2014, it has replaced the tilde constraint uh, that was the most popular one before. But still, if you look at all of those runtime dependencies that are outdated, uh, we see that still uh, quite a significant fraction uh, are using strict constraints. So about one out of three uh, dependencies is using a strict constraint. And this is the reason why uh, these dependencies are still being outdated. If they would have used a caret constraint instead they would uh, probably not have, have suffered of uh, being updated. To measure the extent to which one could reduce the 
percentage of packages that are being outdated and suffering from technical lag, uh, we conducted some uh, what-if analysis. The green line represents the proportion of releases that are never uh, adopted automatically because the dependencies are using a too strict constraint. The minor and patches correspond to the use of the uh, caret constraint. It uh, reflects all of those releases that will be automatically adopted uh, if there is a minor upgrade or even a patch upgrade. And the uh, orange one corresponds to the tilde constraint, which is that only patches will automatically be accepted. What we can uh, see is that if one would loosen its uh, dependency constraints to uh, become semantic version compliant, which is the blue curve, then uh, one would be able to uh, reduce the percentage of dependencies being outdated by a factor of about uh, 17%, which is the difference between the green and the blue curve. Now we try to extend this uh, analysis by not only looking at NPM package distribution, but also at other package distributions, in particular cargo packages and Rubyiums. Uh, to do so, we had to write a parser to analyze the different dependency constraints. And what we observed was that even though the way of specifying dependency constraints was syntactically quite similar in the different package distributions, the interpretation of these dependency constraints is not necessarily the same. Take, for example, the specification of a dependency constraint 1.0. We see that it means something different from cargo, where this means anything in the one major version range goes, while for NPM it means only everything going from 1.0 to 1.1, and while in packages it means exactly 1.0. So the way of interpreting a particular uh, first constraint may vary from one ecosystem to another. Uh, if you want to adhere to semantic versioning, then you should use a specification that is semantic versioning compliant. Typically, this is a caret constraint that allows any patch and uh, minor release upgrades. So these are uh, semantic versioning compliant. Uh, other specifications, like exactly one version, uh, they are uh, typically so more restrictive than semantic versioning. And then some constraints are more permissive than semantic versioning because they even allow you to automatically benefit from major version updates. So one analysis we did was to, to, to try to find out to which extent uh, the different considered package distributions adhere to semantic versioning practices. Uh, so to do this, we counted the proportion of constraints that are being semantic versioning compliant in blue more permissive than semantic versioning in green and more restrictive, uh, which is shown in red. What we see is that the first three packaging ecosystems, cargo and PM and packages, they appear to be mostly semantic versioning compliant. It's growing over time and the percentage of uh, constraints that are using uh, semantic versioning compliant constraints is uh, somewhere uh, like between 60 and, and 100%. Well, for RubyGems, we see it's clearly not semantic versioning compliant because the blue curve is quite low, less than uh, 50%. Uh, there is still a high percentage of packages that are actually being too permissive. Uh, and another thing we observe is that there is still a relatively high percentage of constraints that are actually being uh, restrictive, more restrictive than uh, semantic versioning. Uh, the good thing we see here is that at least for the first three package distributions, they tend to become more uh, semver compliant over time. Now, uh, since there is still some proportion of packages that are actually not necessarily semantic versioning compliant, which is what we could see in the previous figure, uh, all the red curves, uh, the question is if you as a maintainer want to depend on some package, how do you know whether it's okay to trust that this package, this required package, is uh, semantic versioning compliant. So how do you, how can you uh, safely decide what is the best dependency constraint to use to depend on a particular package? To do this, we propose to rely on the wisdom of the crowds. So uh, as an example of uh, to illustrate this, you could, uh, for a given package, look at how uh, the different types of dependency constraints 
uh, that refer to a particular package are being distributed. So more concretely, take for example uh, the cargo package Serde. Uh, as a, if suppose you want to depend on such a package, what you could do is to have a look at how many actual packages today in cargo are depending on Serde and what are the dependency constraints being used by them. So in this case in particular, we observe that uh, 575 of the dependents of uh, two Serde use a semantic version in compliance dependency constraint, while only 17 use a more restrictive constraint. So this seems to suggest that it's quite safe to use a semantic version in compliant constraints to depend on uh, the Serde package. Let's take another example in packages, the match to pro core package. Uh, in that case, we observe that of the 51 dependents on the package, the, almost all of them use a permissive constraint. So here one could probably even use a permissive dependency constraint to depend on that particular package. Uh, the situation could also be different. For example, the NPM package React Scripts does not seem to respect semantic versioning. We can see this because uh, 57 of the dependents on this package, uh, out of them, 56 use an actually more restrictive constraint than what could be allowed if it would be semantic versioning compliant. So there it's probably not safe to use a semantic versioning compliant constraint. In some packages it's much much less clear. Take for example the usually popular Rails package in RubyGems. In that case we see a much more widespread uh, variation in the types of dependency constraints being used by dependent packages while the majority, more than 50%, is uh, using a permissive constraint uh, and then about one-fourth is using a compliant constraint, there are still 200 that are using a more restrictive constraint. Probably it's still safe to uh, use a uh, semantic versioning compliant constraint here since uh, 3 out of 4 are being semantic versioning compliant. So as a small summary of what we have uh, seen so far, Semantic versioning is improving over time in the different package distributions, which is good because it's known to reduce uh, outdatedness. To know whether a package is respecting the semantic versioning policy or not, and to know this, one could use Wisdom of the Crowds by looking at how other packages depend on that particular package. The other way around, suppose you are the maintainer of a required package. In that case, suppose you would like to decide what is the best version number to use for your next release. Suppose you want to be semantic versioning compliant, uh, in that case it's always good to check how your actual current dependence will be affected by an update with a new release of your package. So you could actually leverage the test suits of the dependent packages to find out if uh, a new release that uh, you, you will want to make available might actually introduce breaking changes in this dependence. If some of the tests uh, of the dependent packages break when uh, with your new planned release, then probably you should upgrade the major version release. If you don't see any introducing breaking changes in dependence, then it's uh, probably safe to upgrade the minor version number. As the Next part of the presentation, I will focus a little bit on the use of major version 0 because the semantic versioning specification dictates that if you use uh, major version 0 then your package is supposed to be in an initial development stage and one cannot uh, trust any update of this release even if you would update uh, a patch version of this uh, release <laughs> it might still uh, lead to backward incompatible changes. Uh, so this is a really strict uh, way of uh, seeing things. In practice, uh, the three considered package distributions, Cargo, NPM and Packages, are more permissive because uh, if you set a caret or a tilde constraint to a zero version number in these, depend in these package managers, then they actually also allow uh, patch upgrades of these dependencies. So they still assume that patch updates are considered backward compatible. So in this sense, they are more permissive than what semantic versioning is dictating. If you actually look at what is the dependency constraint of packages that 
rely on a package in the zero version space, we indeed see that the dependency constraints they are using are uh, accepting uh, patches in the large majority of the cases. 96% for cargo, 73% for npm and uh, packages. So this indeed shows that uh, dependence on 0.y.z packages assume patches to be compatible. Looking at the way in which dependency constraints are being specified in different package managers, we uh, also found that the use of the carry constraint could be a bit misleading or difficult to interpret because it's, it doesn't mean the same thing depending on whether you want to depend on a zero major version or a higher major version. For any uh, dependency, current dependency constraint to a major version that's higher than zero, uh, this means that uh, it's okay to accept any higher patch version or any higher minor version. Uh, for example, caret 1.2.3 means that any version between 1.2.3 and 2.00 excluded is allowed. If the major version is zero, on the other hand, it only means that any patch uh, upgrade is allowed. So this is, I would say, at least a bit confusing since it's the same syntax and it's just because the first major number is zero or one that the interpretation of the constraint uh, changes. So this uh, simple fact may introduce a, a particular artificial psychological barrier that uh, leads many packages to never upgrade to uh, a release that is higher than 1.0.0, which is indeed something that we observed in practice. We looked at all packages that were in the zero version range to find out whether this proportion of packages with uh, using a major version 0 is increasing or decreasing over time. For NPM we indeed see that there is less and less packages that whose latest release is version 0, but for cargo uh, there is a uh, very high percentage of packages that are still in the 0 version range and for packages uh, it's not high but it's uh, quite stable uh, over time. So there are many packages that remain in the 0 version range and actually if you look at all of those packages that have been in the zero version range and that never migrated to a higher major version we can see that this is actually uh, rather high here for example for cargo we see that 92 percent of the packages that started as a major version zero remained all the time as a major version zero and never actually crossed the uh, 1.0 frontier for NPM, this proportion is still also quite high, uh, 45%. Uh, actually, if you look at those packages that actually ever uh, crossed the 1.0 frontier, it's only the green part, which is less than 1 out of 10 packages actually managed to go from the 0 version to a higher version. So packages do get stuck in the 0 version space. This is a bit counterintuitive because if you have a software that's used in production you should probably uh, rely on a package that is at least in version 1.00 which is the first stable version of your software. Uh, in practice however this does not uh, turn out to be the case so again we did some analysis uh, to find out whether uh, packages that are still in a zero version uh, release are being used by packages that are already above 1.1 and what we observed was that indeed a considerable fraction of packages that are considered to be stable are still relying on packages that are still uh, in the zero uh, version range and this was the case for all of the three uh, ecosystems that we have been analyzing this means that um, these packages for all practical purposes could be considered as being stable since they are used and trusted by other packages that are already in a stable major release range so probably it would be much more clear if all of these packages would strive to breach the 1.00 barrier so that they can signal to all of its dependence that are indeed stable packages.